<clears throat> Sword Art Online huh? sucks. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Click here to subscribe, follow me on Twitter, leave a like, and name your firstborn daughter after me. By now, it's no secret that Sword Art Online is terrible. It is so terrible that the fact that the fact that it's terrible is a meme is a meme. And that's a real shame, because Hunger Games Online with sword lasers is probably the best idea to come out of Japan since ritually cannibalizing their enemies is an intimidation tactic during World War II. Look it up. To those of you who were as disappointed as I was with Reki Kawahara's shitty writing, awful pacing, bland characterization, ignorance of basic game design principles, misogyny, lack of attention to detail, complete disregard for internal consistency. of knowledge of what made his narrative interesting in the first place and voyeuristic sexual exploitation of prepubescent girls, have I got the anime for you. There's this idea called percussive maintenance, where you take a broken electronic device and beat it into submission until it decides to work. And that is exactly what Something Witty Entertainment did with Sword Art Online Abridged. Criticism of SAO is nothing new, but SAO Abridged thrashes its source material so thoroughly that it loops right back around to becoming a loving reconstruction of everything that we all hoped SAO would was going to be. From the characters, to the pacing, to the animation, SAO Abridged isn't just a great parody, it's a better show than Sword Art Online. Before we get into exactly how SAO Abridged fixes the innumerable flaws in its source material, all while remaining one of the funniest abridged series on the market, let's talk about names. This is Kirito, Asuna, and Klein. They're the three most important characters in Sword Art Online, and I'm going to have to talk about them a lot. This is Kirito, Asuna, and Klein. They're the three most important characters in Sword Art Online Abridged, and I'm going to have to talk about them a lot. You see the problem here. So, in order to avoid confusion and to keep myself from having to say Abridged Kirito 347 times, let me introduce you to some new friends of mine. Kurt, Ass, and Balls Deep 69 Everybody see what I'm doing here? Yeah? Okay? Okay. Okay? Okay! The most noteworthy and impactful change that SAO Abridge makes over the original is that people aren't stupid. So many of Sword Art Online's conflicts could be avoided if the people involved didn't have the mental capacities of a sleep-deprived cabbage. Take the moonlit black cats, for example. SAO attempts to justify Kirito's badass lonerness by implying that he feels responsible for what happened to the cats and doesn't want to join any other guild to keep people safe. This makes them incredibly important. Sure is a shame they have the collective IQ of a coffee table. Hey, we have some time to kill. How about we make some extra cash fighting death monsters in this death dungeon where we could die? Never mind that our guild leader is gone. We need chairs. Not to mention the whole reason they all get killed is because Mr. MLG Pro here finds a treasure chest in an empty room and opens it. And I feel like that's all that needs to be said to show that this guy is about as smart as Bakugo. Oh God, what have I done? But the cats aren't off the hook. Let's talk about Kirito. Kirito hides his level from the Moonlit Black Cats because if they knew his real level, they wouldn't want him around. Why? Are you forgetting that this is a death game? Why would anybody not want to hang out with people who are good at the death game? Now, it's never explicitly stated why hanging out with someone at a much higher level than you is a liability because Sword Art Online because Sword Art Online. But as far as I can tell, Kirito being around makes higher level monsters spawn. And if that's the case, then Kirito knows that getting into a combat situation with the cats is a bad idea. So why did he say nothing when it was suggested that they go into the dungeon? If he knew that his very presence would cause Trogdor to come in and burninate all his friends, then congratulations, Kirito. You are so socially incompetent that you committed manslaughter bully for you. The actions of these characters are completely incongruous with a world in which people have both a fear of death and a basic knowledge of cause and effect. Which is why Sword Art Online Abridged completely rewrites this entire plotline. For starters, not only does Kurt not hide his level from Kaida, Kaida approaches him because he wants a higher level player in his guild, which, you know, makes sense. Why does Gary run right into the most obvious trap since this? Because he's an NPC set to auto-loot. And why are they in the dungeon in the first place? For chairs? Nope, because they're in debt to the mob and have to find a replacement for the special item that Charisma Hat stole. This slash and burn approach to adaptation is what allows something witty entertainment to take Sword Art Online from a barely coherent mess of broken dreams and lost potential and turn it into a series that isn't downright insulting to anybody who has a better critical eye than a trained eggplant. In addition to the obvious benefit of logic, these massive changes result in more complex and meaningful character development than 
that happens in SAO proper, and not just among the main cast. Even the most minor of side characters are given unique personalities and quirks that tend to be entirely absent from the original series. This allows something witty to turn totally forgettable, generic, non-characters like this into real people with personalities that we actually care about. In SAO, Godfrey is- this guy's name is Godfrey- is a plot device whose only purpose in the narrative is to get Kirito and Kuridil alone together and then get killed just so the viewer knows that this guy is crazy. In Abridged, he's Godfrey the role player, the quirky, endearing doof who badly quotes Shakespeare and really seems to be trying to make everyone around him happy. And when Kuridil stabs him and he breaks character to start pleading for his life, that's a hilarious but still tragic moment that actually hits home and makes the viewer care about someone they didn't even remember after watching the original series. And then there's Sachi. In the original series, Sachi is a tool. Her entire purpose is to die and give Kirito a reason to be a strong, independent swordsman who don't need no guild. She has no outstanding character traits except for the ones that help her die sadder, and the effect that she has on Kirito is straightforward, linear, logically suspect, and poorly executed. In Abridged, she makes Kurt go through an entire emotional arc and back again, and the psychological scars that he suffers after her death stick with him long into the series' endgame and have a profound effect on everything he does. When Kirito talks with Sachi under the moping bridge, she tells him that she's afraid to die, which is reasonable, but also true of literally anybody else, and does nothing to endear us to her character any more than we're endeared to this guy. Kirito answers that he won't let her die, then she dies anyway and he's sad. In the abridged series, Sachi's impact is much deeper and more nuanced than it is in the original. When the whole guild gets wiped in the abridged series, it's not because some inhumanly idiotic disgrace to the species falls for an obvious trap, it's because Sachi sets an NPC to auto-loot because she thinks it will save time. This is a multi-layered tragic moment that enhances our sympathy for two different characters. First of all, Sachi was terrified that she was going to be the one to get her friends killed, but instead of it being an accident caused by her bad connection, the deaths of her friends were entirely the result of an avoidable mistake that was completely under her control. This is undercut a little bit, since her party in the bridge series consists entirely of NPCs, but it's still way more impactful than I hid my level and now you're dead. Her effect on Kurt is significantly deeper as well. From the beginning of the abridged series, Kurt has been a self-assured, overconfident dickbag with a superiority complex who sees the suffering of weaker players as a source of entertainment. He says he doesn't want to team up with other players because they're a bunch of mouth-breathing neckbeards, and Diabelle praises him for being so wise when he goes on his rant about how lions don't concern themselves with the opinions of sheep, reinforcing that he is right to see the people around him as useless, inferior beings. When Sachi tells him that she's afraid her lag is going to get everyone she loves killed, Kurt is confronted with something that he can't find a way to mock, which makes him question his cocksure attitude for the first time in the series. The ensuing conversation makes Kurt see the error of his ways, and he resolves to stop being a sociopathic fuck muncher and give people a shot. Sachi is Kurt's way of giving humanity a chance to prove its worth. He lets himself be vulnerable to one person, one time, and that vulnerability is immediately and harshly kicked in the dick. Sachi's death reconfirms for Kurt that his former distance attitude was correct, and that allowing people to get close to you won't cause anything but pain. This is further shown when he talks with Balls at the end of the episode. Since they first met, Kurt has always referred to Klein by his screen name, Balls Deep 69 as a way of having some small bit of power over him. When he's going after the item from the Christmas event, Klein tells him that there's a chance it can resurrect players, and that knowledge gives Kurt just a little bit of hope that his vulnerability towards Sachi wasn't completely wasted. As a result, he responds, Thank you, Klein, showing this other player a rare sign of respect. After risking his life against Smurf Santa to have a chance at saving Sachi, Kurt is rewarded with a hat for his trouble. Now, his attempts to show faith in humanity have been foiled three times. First, when Sachi died. Second, when the hope at reviving her was taken from him. And third, when Klein betrayed him by giving him that hope in the first place. Even if Sword Art Online had accomplished what it set out to do with Sachi's character, Kirito wouldn't have had an arc so much as a straight line going from a relatively nice, sociable dude who's a bit on the awkward side to a self-imposed pariah who's too afraid of getting other people killed to join up with them. In Abridged, he starts with posturing and presenting presenting himself as a total ass who doesn't care about humanity at all while actually really wanting people to like him. Then he gets that point of view reaffirmed after the fight against Ilfang, then questioned by Sachi, then reaffirmed by Sachi, then questioned by Bo. 
balls, then reaffirmed by Santa in an emotional cycle that beats him down so far into the dirt that he thanks balls for showing him that there was still a part of him that could love people, because now that he knows where to find it, he can kill it forever. This is normally the part in this video where I would really start delving into Kurt's character, but I'm not going to do that. Instead, since there's enough content about him, ass, and Yui to make that its own video, I'm gonna make that its own video. For now, let's go back to this whole thing about people not being stupid and talk about Kayaba. Trivia question. Why does Kayaba Akihiko make Sword Art Online kill people? Don't remember? Neither does he! Ain't that some shit? I mean, I get it, man. Sometimes you just do things. No worries, I'm sure that'll hold up in court. The lack of compelling motivation isn't just stupid. It turns Akihiko from a potentially brilliant character into a plot contrivance, acting as yet another sword in the back of SAO's potential. Thankfully, as usual, the abridged series is here to save the day. In SAO abridged, the first few SAO-related deaths were the result of a glitch in the system that was caused by a rushed release. And since Akihiko is crazy from having gone three weeks without sleep to get the damn thing finished, he panics and locks everyone in the game so that he can pretend it's all part of some master plan until he finds a way to keep the cops off his back. The writers of the abridged series realized that there was no possible motivation that a sane man could have for doing all this, so they needed to add some insanity to Kayaba's character. Problem is, they'd already portrayed him as being ruthlessly competent when he's playing the part of Heathcliff. Their reconciliation of these two portrayals of Akihiko both makes sense and play into his backstory as a game developer. Since nothing drives game developers insane like being overworked, underslept, and working on a deadline they know they can't keep. Speaking of Heathcliff, then there's that whole, you fools, I was Kayaba the whole time bit. Unless you've seen Sword Art Online, there is no way to properly appreciate how jarring this scene is. We all know that SAO has pacing problems, but there is a big difference between lingering on one scene a little bit too long and ending the story 25 floors early because the writers just got bored? And the way this happens doesn't even make sense. There are two key pieces of evidence backing up Kirito's shocking revelation that the leader of the Knights of the Blood Oath was actually Kayaba Akihiko in a pair of Groucho Marx glasses. He moved really, really fast one time, and there's nothing less fun than watching someone else play an RPG. With the first part, Kirito seems to forget that Sword Art Online is an irreparably broken game. The unique skill system makes it so that there's nothing stopping a player from being able to do pretty much anything, including moving lightning fast and blocking an otherwise perfectly placed attack. As for watching someone else play an RPG, I'm subscribed to this little channel called The Game Grumps, who just finished a playthrough of Breath of the Wild. Give that a gander, Kirito, and tell me how boring it is watching people play RPGs after you've vicariously experienced Dan and Aaron's perfect friendship. The kind of friendship that you know is absent from your own life because you never developed social skills in high school, and now you don't know how to talk to people because you're a shut-in neat who spends every day writing YouTube videos about shitty anime while drinking raw Baileys at noon in your apartment in Belgium. The abridged series plants the seeds of Kaiaba's true identity in the first episode when final form floating personification of death Kaiba references Tron and Scanners. After Heath is introduced, those movie references continue. These allusions to Kaiba's favorite films create a narrative through line that allows Kurt to turn a long series of individual events into a strong case against the leader of the game's strongest guild. Or at least a stronger case than nobody could beat me in a fight without cheating. And the movie references don't only serve to make Kaiba's alter ego make sense, they also create a connection between him and Kurt. Kurt also constantly makes movie references throughout the series, which reflects the way in which he and Akihiko are similar. They're both massive nerds with no friends who are tired of living in a world where everyone they know is intellectually beneath them, and getting trapped in this game is probably the best thing that's ever happened to both of them. When Kaiba finds out that Kurt gets his movie references, he is overjoyed at having finally found someone who understands him and his misanthropic tendencies. The problem is that Kurt has undergone a whole character arc at this point and has begun to legitimately care about humanity, thus breaking the bond between him and Kaiba, which is represented when Kurt stabs Kaiba while quoting Mythbusters and Kaiba attributes the quote to Dungeon Master, a film that Kurt has never even heard of. And if that wasn't enough, then during the last scene with Kurt and Ass, when Kurt finally says I love you to her for the first time, she says I know, quoting Han Solo in Battlestar Galactica. Ass's use of a movie reference here cements Kurt's progress as a character, showing now that he identifies more with Ass than he could have with the genocidal Kaiba. And the abridged series doesn't just fix characterization issues either, there are also subtle changes in pacing, editing, and animation that just make it pop. For example, during the fight with Ilfang in the original series, right after the door 
door opens, we get this brief clip of the kobold lord sitting on his throne in the dark. This subconsciously preps the viewer for a moment of tension where the army slowly walks forward with the boss looming silently over them, waiting to strike as they enter his domain. Instead, he jumps through the air like an overstuffed tube sock out of some madman's laundry cannon and starts cutting through people like that guy from Too Many Cooks at Thanksgiving dinner. Just cutting out that one shot of Ilfang on his throne makes this whole scene flow 20 times better. I counted. And it's not just subtle changes. SAO Abridge cuts out so much unnecessary bullshit that you could make a whole new bull out of the shit, and this metaphor isn't going quite the way I wanted to, but the point is that the Einkrad arc in SAO proper is six hours long. In SAO Abridged, it's just over three, and nothing of importance is lost. Do you remember when this guy from the fishing arc talks about soy sauce? Do you remember this guy from the fishing arc? Do you remember the fishing arc? Neither does SAO Abridged, and it's better for it. Then there's the OP. My god, does this series have a stellar OP. I mean, Jeff isn't gonna wanna fuck it, but he's also not gonna wanna beat it hard enough to make small children uncomfortable like he did with the OPs of SAO proper. If nothing else, the OP is short and well edited with a fantastically chosen theme song that actually plays during the final fight against Kaiba. I don't know how SAO managed to fuck up the most obvious and badass anime trope of all time, but there is nothing more hype than hearing the first bars of the OP opening theme song play while the main character and the big bad evil guy stare each other down. And then, the way the music abruptly cuts out when Kurt's sword breaks on Kaiba's shield really sells his desperation and the sense of defeat he feels at having finally been bested when so much was on the line. But the most impressive change to me is the subtle edits made to animation in the series. And I'm not talking about making characters roll their eyes or the addition of new characters, I mean the minor tweaks that don't do anything to make the episode fun but that seriously improve the quality of the show overall. The best example of this is the fight between Yui and this sentient Halloween costume. When Yui summons her sword in SAO proper, it's a little girl with big sword moment. And that's fine, but the idea of an unstoppably badass nine-year-old girl is kinda tired at this point, and it doesn't tell the viewer anything new about Yui except that she can summon a big sword. When this scene happens in the Abridged series, there's this cool distortion effect that really sells the idea that she's hacking into the system to gain access to powers that she shouldn't be able to. Able to use. It takes advantage of the setting and Yui's identity as an AI while creating a link between this scene and the one where she explains that the system is going to delete her code. This animation tweak didn't have to happen. Nobody would have expected it to happen, but they did it anyway because they knew it would improve the show. And that's the really special thing about SAO Abridged. There are so many lazy Abridged series out there trying to cash in on the popularity of the trope, and almost none of them do anything to improve on their source material. SAO Abridged clearly comes from a place of deep respect for what Sword Art Online could have been, and the creators go above and beyond to make good on all of the promise that Aincrad had. And I'm glad they did, because I I wanted to like Sword Art Online. I think most of us wanted to like Sword Art Online. And now, thanks to something witty entertainment, I can. Happy 20,000 subscriber special, everybody! I opened a Twitter. You know, I really want to do something cool for these subscriber milestones, but damn it, you're subscribing faster than I can celebrate. Anyway, about my next video. I normally try to put something out every two weeks, but the next video might be a bit later since I'm moving to a different house, in a different country, across the ocean. So I might be a bit too busy in the next few weeks to write 4,000 words about the beautiful dysfunction that is Kurt and Ass's relationship. So since we might have a tiny hiatus, I figure it's it's time for a challenge. As you may know, we are currently locked in a one-sided fight to the death with Pedantic Romantic, and I want to win in those three weeks. That means a little over 34,000 subscribers before my next video goes out. It's a tall order, but if you do it, weekly videos all through August. I can't do it in July because of the whole moving continents thing. So if you like me, if you like content, if you like the month of August, subscribe to Explanation Point. Succumb to Explanation, explanation point. point. Spread the word of Explanation, explanation point. point. Share my explanation minions. Point. Explanation, explanation Point. Share! Explanation Point. Explanation Point. Explanation Point. Holy fuck. Explanation Point. Explanation Point. Explanation Point. Point points. Until next time, this has been Explanation Point. Signing the waiver before the big fight with Pedro. Good luck, senpai.